Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the next video in the educational series covering the topic of what is crossover hearing. We hear about crossover hearing a lot when we talk about masking, and I know that the term can get confused sometimes with interaural attenuation. It'd be a good idea to check out the interaural attenuation video before you watch this video. So I've put a card up at the top, click on that and watch that video before you keep going here. So what is crossover hearing? Imagine that you're in your bedroom sleeping. Your roommate, on the other hand, is in the living room watching something very, very, very noisy on TV or blaring really, really loud music. Some of that noise from the one room makes it into your bedroom, and if it's loud enough noise, it'll wake you up. Now, with crossover hearing, we're not really talking about living rooms and bedrooms, but we're talking about a person. And we're really comparing putting a signal into one ear and having it cross over and be heard in the other ear. So in this case, let's put a small sound into the right ear. Some of that sound is going to cross over and be heard by the left ear. Not all of the sound you put into the right ear will make it to the left ear. Some of it will get attenuated or reduced, and that's where the interaural attenuation video comes in. If the sound that crosses over gets attenuated enough or if it's a quiet enough sound, then your left ear or the other ear won't respond and it'll continue sleeping just fine. But if you put a bigger sound into that other ear, then the sound that crosses over to the other side might be loud enough for you to hear it. This is particularly a problem if you're doing a hearing test and somebody doesn't have any hearing in one of their ears. If they're not responding to your stimulus, you might turn up the level of your audiometer and turn it up and turn it up and make it a really, really big loud stimulus. But when you present that loud stimulus to the other ear, even though they're not really hearing it in the right ear, the patient is going to respond. Again, not because they heard it in the ear you're testing, but because they heard it in the non-test ear, because the sound crossed over and the right ear stimulus was heard in the left ear. In this situation, you would definitely want to mask the left ear by putting some noise in there to be sure to cover it up. Let's go into the class program to show you a little bit more about how this works using a live simulation. In this simulated case, we have an asymmetrical hearing loss with hearing within normal limits in the right ear and a moderately severe flat hearing loss in the left ear. We're going to go ahead and just present a stimulus here at 30 dBHL and then we'll talk about what's happening present my stimulus and I don't get a response. There was no flashing light on this bar, which means that the level of the stimulus wasn't heard by the test or the non-test ear. In this case, we presented at 30 dB HL in the left ear and the interaural attenuation is 40 dB. So the amount of the stimulus that crossed over is 30 minus that 40 dB of interaural attenuation. So this 30 dB sound crossed over but got smaller by 40 dB and was present in the right ear at negative 10 dBHL. The amount that crossed over is lower than the threshold of hearing in that ear, so we didn't get a response. If we increase the level by 10 dB because they didn't respond and present again, you'll notice that we get a response this time. And if we're not getting a response because we heard it in the test ear, we're getting a response because of crossover hearing. We presented the stimulus at 40 dBHL, and that stimulus as it crossed over was attenuated by 40 dB and was presented to the right ear or the non-test ear at a level of zero dBHL, which is at the threshold of hearing for that ear at 1000 Hertz. So they responded, but not because we, were, we found their threshold in the test ear, but rather because some of that signal crossed over to the non-test ear and resulted in them responding. Again, in this case, we would need to turn on masking so that we can put enough of a masker noise in to cover that non-test ear in order to accurately test the true thresholds. And if you want to learn more about masking, we have a whole video series on how to finding out how to mask and uh, learning when you should mask air and bone conduction. So check out the cards and the links below to get to those videos. Thanks for watching the video. Hit the subscribe button and the like button on your way out and we'll see you next time.